Hello everyone, welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. I'm your host, as always, James W. Gesso. This is a podcast that explores topics relevant and related to psychedelic culture, medicine, and research, always with the underlying question of how do we work with and through our psychedelic experiences to become better people, not just for ourselves, but for those we are in relationship with, and not just other people, but even other cultures and non-humans as well, our relationship with the various occupants of the natural world. And it is with respect to the latter, I suppose, that uh, we feature the guests we have on the show for this episode. Their names will be mentioned in a moment, but what is important to mention is that this is a Psychedelic Cafe episode, which is a sort of micro series that happens here at Adventures of the Mind, where instead of a regular interview with me and one or two other people, it's a curated selection of guests that go through a specific conversational structure that explores a central question. It's based on the structure of the Conversation Cafe, and if you'd like to learn more about that, there's links uh, to that in the show notes for this episode of jameswgesso.com. Anyways, before I introduce the question, I'm going to give you a little bit about our curated guests for today, because each of them are actually speakers from the upcoming conference, the Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs, also known as the ESPD-55. It's a conference that's being organized by the McKenna Academy, which is Dennis McKenna, for those of you who are savvy to that name, uh, where, quote, 33 of the most exciting minds in psychoactives research present 37 sessions exploring the world of ethnopharmacologic knowledge through various life-centric themes. The conference is happening May 23rd to 26th, and the conference organizers have been generous in offering their access to the live stream by donation with a minimum of only $10 US, which is super low price. So that's really appreciated. Uh, personally, I really appreciate that to the uh, conference organizers. Thank you. Um, for those of you listening, if you want to check out the conference, go to ESPD55.com. Links again will be in the show notes. Nevertheless, this episode is not about the conference. It's a psychedelic cafe surrounding, surrounding the following question. What does ethnopharmacology have to teach humanity in our present times? Now, in exploring this question, we end up wondering about the reconciliation of humanity with nature, what traditional and indigenous knowledge systems hold for our capacity to facilitate this reconciliation, the importance and challenge of good reciprocity, fair compensation, and the prioritization and protection of indigenous sovereignty, the importance of all of this in the face of growing global climate crisis, and where psychedelic plants and psychedelic experiences fit within it all. So that's what we're going to explore today here on the Psychedelic Cafe of Adventures Through the Mind. Uh, and before we jump into it, thank you so much to my patrons on Patreon who make this podcast possible, especially the people whose names are listed on the screen here on YouTube or in the description to this episode, wherever you're checking it out. Those names also include people who have left significant one-time donations. So to those people, and then generally to my patrons as a whole, and to those donating, it just means so much for me to receive your financial support and thus sort of larger non-financial support expressed through finances to help this show continue and the work that informs it continue. Um, doing this is a deeply meaningful thing in my life, and I strongly desire to have it be a thing that contributes value to individuals who listen and to the culture as a, as a whole. And so thank you very, very much, especially in this time where I've been struggling with the actual process of doing the work due to the concussion I incurred back in January. Your continued support has been just, there aren't words. Uh, so just thank you. If you're not yet a patron of the show and you'd like to become one, please do head to patreon.com forward slash James DeBuchesso. There are other support options such as through PayPal or cryptocurrency. If you would just like to give a one-time donation and links to all of that is contained in the description to this episode, wherever you're checking it out, there's even options to buy shirts or digital products, all of which support the show financially. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much for doing so. And without any further ado, here is 
the Psychedelic Cafe number eight on adventures through the mind, uh, exploring the question of what does ethnopharmacology have to teach humanity in our present times? Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Psychedelic Cafe. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank okay. you for having us. Uh, so we'll do our first introductions where you'll each introduce yourselves in the order that I see you on my screen, which is Colin, Michael, Geronimo, and David. And I will start with myself uh, as I'm James Jesso. I'm the host of this podcast, um, and I'm here to help support this inquiry on ethnopharmacology, but also to support the uh, symposium coming up, the E. SPD 55, um, which will have more details in the intro when I record later. Um, and so that's me, Colin. Sure. Thanks for having us, first of all. Um, I'm Colin Domnauer. I graduated from UC Berkeley a few years ago, and I did my senior thesis studying the pre Columbian use of uh, some hallucinogenic plants in the Andes. And so that's sort of the background I bring to this conversation. And uh, it's a pleasure to support ESPD in any way I can. So thanks. Uh, thank you. My name is Michael Coe. I'm an ethnobiologist. Uh, my work has been primarily focused on plant use, uh, medicinal plant use and selection by um, indigenous peoples and local communities in the Amazon basin. I've worked specifically with people in Knievel communities. I'm also interested in um, so how understanding how we can learn about the demographic responses of ayahuasca to uh, various harvesting intensities and how that might be able to inform sustainable harvest production. So, oh, in addition, I've also helped to organize the students uh, section for the ESPD 55 symposium, the emerging investigators. So, yeah. Uh, my name is Geronimo Matarraza. Um, I work for the ICRS Foundation. I'm a um, social innovation coordinator. Um, that means social obviously means groups of people and innovation means new things. And it basically means that my work revolves around getting groups of people to do new things. Most of my work right now revolves around ceremonial plant work outside of the countries of origin. Now, before I did all this in a, in a, in a, in a past life, I worked on a number of documentaries that were all, all revolving, four of them, all of them revolving over, up around different aspects of indigenous knowledge and if it, its encounter with the West, a couple of them having to do specifically with plant medicines. And even before that, um, I was very, uh, the sort of lifelong fascinated. I'm not an anthropologist or a biologist, but I have read them a lot. I, 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 I don't know so many people who are not anthropologists that I've read as much anthropology as I have, even really odd thesis and, you know, very random stuff. I've had really, uh, 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 it's given me so much joy and pleasure. I've enjoyed it so much. Um, and also sometimes, you know, I must say, uh, quite boring as well. <laughs> there are certain aspects of, of, you know, sort of like this whole thing with the family trees and, and, the, and, the, and the cross cousins um, that just boggles my, but uh, I would say that I'm sort of like an anthropology, I don't know what to call it, a, a hobbyist, which is a, a very rare thing. Um, so I'm happy to be here. My name is David Rodriguez. I am from Bogota, Colombia. I am an ethnobotanist, also ethnobiologist, but I have worked primarily with plants, documenting plant uses. Um, most recently, I have uh, conducted research on the diversity of uh, the Jaje, mostly known as Ayahuasca Liana, in southwestern Colombia. And I have uh, recently, last year, started my PhD in environmental anthropology, where I will continue this a study of the diversity of, of Jaje in southwestern Colombia. Um, but also, I will be looking into um, exchange routes of our varieties um, and trying to, to delve a little bit into the historicity of, of um, ayahuasca as well. And um, hoping to also uh, support efforts to 
established histories of um, marginalized groups that uh, have not uh, been able to really uh, just get an overview really of what the previous generations of their history has been uh, due to different issues in Colombia. Uh, we have had, as you may be very familiar with, uh, conflicts of, of different sorts. So um, I'm hoping to support those efforts as well. Um, and my um, PhD is being conducted at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Very happy to be here too. All right, great. So thanks everyone. Uh, now we'll get into the cafe itself. And for this first round in the same order, Colin, Michael, Geronimo, uh, David, not David, is that correct? David. 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 I'll do my best. David. Um, in that order. And then I'll, I'll end rather than introducing, rather than being the first person to talk on the idea, I'll be the last before we get into the, um, into the conversation, uh, which will be a discussion on the central question, which is, what does ethnopharmacology have to teach humanity in our present times? So Colin, Michael, Geronimo, David, and myself will go in that order. If you're not ready to speak uh, on that, just pass, and then we'll come back to you at the end. So take it away, Colin, whenever you're ready. Sure. So I think ethnopharmacology is, is one way of highlighting this enormous amount of wealth and, and wisdom that is contained at this intersection of biology and culture. And this is a very rich and ancient repository of uh, knowledge and medicinal potential that has been accumulated and refined over you know, thousands of years in the case of these cultures and knowledge systems and, and millions of years in the case of the molecular diversity of nature. And yet it's very quickly being lost or forgotten. So I think we need a greater acknowledgement and, and awareness of this value. And, and I think this is precisely what ethnopharmacology seeks to do. Um, not, not only by studying the, these new bioactive substances, but also how they're used and perceived within the cultural context. And, and this is just as important because, you know, as we know, the, you know, effectiveness of a, a drug or a treatment is not only a product of the substance, but the so-called set and setting. And, you know, this is, in other words, the cultural context in which it's used and, and perceived. So, I guess that's my main point is how is the ethnopharmacology acknowledges this fact by using an interdisciplinary approach of investigating, yes, the bioactive substances, but also appreciating how they're being uh, perceived and used by uh, these cultures. And so hopefully this, uh, greater uh, appreciation for the healing potential contained in these knowledge systems and ecosystems can help um, demonstrate the importance of, of and value of sustaining this biocultural diversity into the future. Yeah, it's, um, you know, ethnopharmacology really has, a, you know, a broad spectrum of, you know, scientific inquiry. And I think really ethnobiology as a whole, you know, if we step up from this sub-discipline of ethnopharmacology has a tremendous role in uh, providing a platform for people to really understand the relationship between human societies and the natural world. And I think quite often, you know, with the, you know, in, with the civilization and, and and the notions of separation from nature, you know, often, um, you know, the Western world is quite, uh, in many cases, systematically separated from our connection to nature, when indeed, we can learn from local peoples and indigenous communities, that we are indeed not separate from nature. And this is something that has been a part of us since 
the dawn of consciousness. And, you know, ethnopharmacology and ethnobiology is a wonderful, you know, platform and, and field of investigation that we can really reconnect with the true essence of being a part of nature. And I think within that spectrum, there's so much to be learned. There's so much wisdom. And, you know, it's a challenging state in our world today because much of this knowledge is being forced out of existence. And so, you know, as a researcher, you know, coming from, you know, non-traditional uh, culture, it's a challenge because, you know, you really want to uh, do the best that you can to honor these systems in such a way uh, to bring this awareness into the global sphere so that people can recognize that, you know, our greatest gifts come from the natural world. And it's important to really honor them and to respect them and to really honor the traditional cultures that have kept these knowledge systems thriving through the millennia and through time. And uh, it's an honor and privilege to be at this, you know, at this point in history, because I think that this platform of ethnobiology and, and, and ethnopharmacology really is, uh, you know, our great potential to bring this into the awareness to the global community. You know, many of us have forgotten this importance of, of you know, the greatest medicines that we have are from the natural world and are in, often in our gardens, you know, and I think uh, remembering that we can use these medicines responsibly and heal ourselves and we have the full potential and the capacity to be a loving global community to nature, to ourselves and to the planet is uh, essential. So I think that, you know, it, in many cases, this is what the discipline and, and um, you know, further work in this area can really do for, for humanity. That's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I, um, I'm going to bring a little bit, like I said, because I've been sort of a, a visitor in this field. Um, and from, from the perspective of a visitor and, uh, and from my personal perspective, I think I'm going to take it a little bit further back. I, I think the, 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 the greatest gift that comes from the encounter with the other, with people that are not like you, um, or that are significantly different than you. But this doesn't happen only, you know, when one encounters indigenous cultures, it also happens in, you know, in relationships and in couples and all of this. Um, there's, there's, there's a number of sort of, you know, um, um, it, it, irreplaceable sort of dynamics that cannot happen in any other situation except this, you know. One of it is, of course, that you're going to notice and you're going to learn things that you didn't know. You're going to have another person, another culture, another thing that will open to you a, a, a ways of seeing and, and being in the world that you didn't even, they were sort of, you know, even blind spots, you know, uh, in your own in your own makeup. And this, of course, is it's... it's um, it's 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 part of the fascination, you know, and this sort of treasure that one uncovers. But I, but I, but I think there's even a more sort of you know deeper uh, and even perhaps you know more uh, um, um, a, 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 rich, a richer treasure there, which is how that makes you reconsider. Um, so it's not about the lives of others, but how that reflects on your own life, on the life of your culture, on what your traditions mean for you, or what ancestors mean for you, on what, you know, so suddenly like the, the, the you know, I, you know, some anthropologists said that the anthropologists control equivocation, you know, and it's about how difficult it is to really understand um, uh, others. But at the same time, how rich it is in terms of how it, ins it, it inspires oneself to understand oneself better. Mm -hmm. And that can only come with the mirror that is the other, uh, that is the different, uh, in, a, in a sort of, in a sort of um, um, an agreement. So, you know, to give an example of just sort of the basic level, uh, I would say, is, you know, one thing that that you know that is you know absolutely fascinating that i think indigenous cultures put in front of us is the idea that 
you know, medicinal plants, let's call them that, are not, uh, they're not objects to be used, they're relationships to be lived. Now, this is, this is already quite a big sort of this idea that one deals with these, with these plants almost, not almost, but like they were people. Mm. In, that's the sort of that's that's the one side of it and then I would say the other treasure is and this I think comes with time or at least with me it came with after many years of fascination with indigenous cultures how one ends up actually turning the gaze to the other side and you begin to look at your own family and your own culture and your own grandparents and ancestors and your own botanical practices and you know and, and then one, one, one becomes um, so in in a in a in a really strange way, this encounter with the other ends up sort of bringing you back home mm -hmm. and deeper. Um, and I think this is also so it's like a double uh, um, double treasure. Yeah, thank you all. So to me, ethnopharmacology will have several things to to teach the world at present. Um, the most obvious of, of them, which uh, I think everyone can recognize, it's how many cultures in the world have contributed to our medicine, our health, and particularly to the biomedical system um, that is dominant at present. And, and with that, also, we can recognize that there is um, ownership and intellectual property that derives from many cultures. And, and I think there it's a really important bridge to, to put or build through ethnopharmacology to bring equality in the world. Um, but with it, we can also see how, well, each culture um, has a, a grasp and, and a relation with uh, these um, organisms that were started to contribute or to isolate medicines, so to speak, that correspond to specific ontologies, the specific understandings of reality that I think are still um, very much disregarded or not very well um, accepted by the world. And, and I think that that's crucial because in those differences of the realities that each culture experience, experiences, there's great potential to face with, I think, a more robust um, understanding and web network, the ensuring issues that we're facing. Um, at the same time, I think that that brings the possibility for us to, to have a reflexivity of, of what we do and how we establish these relationships as well with these substances or organisms. And to the point in which hopefully we can get a, a grasp, and especially that's through of all um, psychoactive substances, psychoactive uh, plants, um, teachers, that we can have the reflexivity in which we reflect ourselves with those organisms in the experience. So we can recognize ourselves as equal, at least to a certain level. And ethnopharmacology also offers that chemically. So we are also one and the same tissue through the same chemicals that are shared. Uh, at times we also produce them uh, or at times we, uh, by experiencing them, we, we get to be uh, merged into one. Um, and yeah, finally, just to emphasize that we require at present, I, I believe, um, to really be able to sustain ourselves in, in the world and, and, and to enable the planet to continue with its course. Um, to tackle equality, I mean, inequality, to resolve inequality. And, and I think that ethnopharmacology has a, a privileged position for us to uh, pave that path. Uh, so for myself, I notice, um, I notice a, a slight sort of like twinge of, of, of fear or inadequacy due to my sort of sense of lack of authority in any sense to speak on ethnopharmacology. But... Um, what I the one thought that I'm holding now is is ethnopharmacology, if I understand it, is sort of like the the specific like investigation of specific cultural and place use of like 
things that alter pharmacology, so plants, et cetera. And if I think about how much, uh, what is altering my pharmacology, what is altering the sort of neural functioning of my brain and thus, you know, in a significant part, the sort of like reality uh, mapping generating experience I have of, of, of life, my own life, the lives of others, et cetera. And think about sort of where I'm in, say just Canada, Ontario, and the sort of like things that are available to me in the, in the present cultural context I'm in, which is pretty minimal. You know, there's like hyper-focus on, you know, like, like coffee, cruciferous vegetables, you know, access to sort of standard grocery store stuff. And the reality I experienced was sort of the wash of pharmacology available to me as a very specific way of being in the world, which on mass scale, but also on a deeply personal scale, is sort of like hollowing out, like hollowing out the, like the soul of what it is to be alive in some sense and replacing it with some sort of distorted caricature of what life is supposed to be or should be at something. And when I think about the study of ethnopharmacology of like going in and studying these plants from different places, et cetera, and sort of how that study sparks anecdotes and reports and et cetera. And for all its understandable ills, you know, a commodification around specialized plants that move around the world and et cetera, that eventually because of that commodification network, find their way into like my little life and changing my pharmacology, changing experientially, changing the map by which I understand myself in the world and again, for all its sort of like goods and ills is very complex, putting me in direct link with a different way of being in the world, which could spark an excitement that leads me to all of a sudden wanting to be like, where does this come from? Like, what does this experience mean? Finding me back to the original ethno of where it came from and perhaps a sense of there being something more than the world that I've been sort of born into, uh, which is the same world that is sort of presently hollowing out the, the future integrity of the entire biosphere, that there's other places and other possibilities out there. There's, there's just something to that that feels like, oh, okay, wow, good. <laughs> wow, you know, that maybe would not have been there before or definitely wouldn't have been there before in the same way. Um, so for whatever coherency that managed, um, we'll close this round and we'll get into the next round of the conversation. Um, and uh, this round, we just talk openly with each other surrounding this question. And at some point I'll time keep and move us into the last round. So anyone can speak at any time uh, and here we are. So just for clarity, this is our open discussion. Yes. Continuing on with the same um, topic. Yes. Around the central question, what well, does what? ethnopharmacology have to teach humanity in our present times? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, one thing I would love for us to consider too, and I think many of us are touching on this topic really is, uh, you know, the reconciliation between humanity and nature. You know, and I think that's an important um, distinction here, you know, because I think depending on the culture in which one, you know, comes from, we have a completely, you know, different connection and relationship with the natural world. And that is one of the beauties that I think, you know, again, ethnopharmacology, um, you know, even ethnobiology in general, I prefer to focus on that lens because that's primarily where my work is from. But I think really we do, like um, Gerano Mo had touched on, when we are working and studying different cultures, we see different perspectives and different ways of being, like the diversity of the human experience. You know, we have all these ways of seeing and ways of relating to the natural world that informs our relationship. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about being alive, is that we have all these diverse cultures and people all around the world, you know, having these relationships with plants. And based on these relationships, the worldviews are quite different, you know. And I think, um, you know, 
it's a challenging place in history because we have this, you know, perhaps in some cases, a dominance of the prevailing culture that's based on, you know, looking at resources and extracting them and using them for, you know, financial and uh, commercial gain and so on and so forth, which has led to a lot of the biocultural and uh, conservation crises. You know, if we look at the deforestation of the Amazon, for example, and, and, you know, and how, you know, this is really threatening the, the social and ecological systems that are really, um, you know, important to humanity, but also to the homeostatic ecosystems or systems in place for the planet, you know, and I think, you know, these are huge challenges currently facing our global family is, is really this relationship between plants and, and our cultures and how we, you know, how we view them. So if we view something as a resource and we're constantly extracting this resource and we're, you know, and we're, you know, feeding this, you know, uh, I like to call it, uh, you know, this pursuit of material wealth over inner riches. I think that's one of the challenges of our society today. Um, you know, this causes, you know, this comes at a great cost, you know, a great cost because we're, you know, complete ways of being, this diversity of the human experience are, is being wiped out. And it's, you know, in many cases beyond uh, people's ability to be, you know, adaptive at such a rate to be resilient. And so, you know, this is one of the messages I, I hope that can get out there from this discussion is that, you know, we're at a critical juncture in history. And I think all of us who have backgrounds in anthropology uh, or are even interested in, in ethnobiology, if you have natural science or social science background, uh, many of us beyond the contribution to science, we have this you know, potential to really highlight the diversity of the ways of being and ways of knowing and ways of relating and to the natural world in such a way that hopefully we can inspire this reconciliation with nature, you know, or at least spark the catalyst of thought and how we can reevaluate our own relationships uh, with the natural world. And I hope that this happens at a global scale because it would be wonderful to see a tremendous change and, 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 you know, looking at food security, global food security, you know, um, you know, medicine security for the world. There's an incredible potential in nature, but if we don't have nature and we don't have a balanced relationship with nature, then none of that will exist as long in addition to ourselves. So I think that's a, this reconciliation and reevaluation ship of our relationship with nature is, is tremendously important. Absolutely, I agree. And, you know, historically, human societies have always <clears throat> relied and valued upon nature and natural products, um, for example, for medicine. And it, this is really just in the last uh, 100 years or so where we have maybe 200 years where we've gone away down to this narrow alley of, of uh, isolated pharmaceutical compounds and sort of develops this uh, hubris that, you know, there's nothing for value for us in the natural world and that we can create everything we need in the laboratory. But uh, this couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, most of our most important medicines come from natural products and we've barely scratched the surface in terms of investigating nature for uh, its, its medicinal potential. I think less than, you know, 1% of, of plant species have been uh, studied. So um, I think we need to get, gain a larger context outside of just where we've gone in the last century or two and view, like Michael was saying, from this larger global scale, um, both spatially, but also temporally, historically, the importance that nature and natural products, as well as the indigenous knowledge systems surrounding their use, the value and importance that this has played throughout human history. And so we really need to sustain this into the future.
Yeah, I, I also think that it is very important for us to, as we acknowledge this division we have between nature and, and culture, to well realize that a lot of the ontologies or, or understandings of reality that have um, resulted from other cultures sharings of, of organisms and, and substances uh, are such in which that division doesn't exist, that categorical understanding, it, it's, it's an, an non-existent. And, and, and therefore, I, I, I do think that it's key for us to find the reconciliation in, in these categorizations through the process of welcoming those other ontologies into the, the way in which we understand concepts in general, in this case, ethnopharmacology, um, but then also even medicine itself, um, so that we can enable ourselves the possibility to establish different relations in, in general to, to these organisms, organisms and, and substances. Um, as Geronimo was mentioning of, with regards to really uh, um, or someone's expression about uh, not having the conception of plants as tools, but more as relations. I think that there is really something key there uh, for us to not only face this issue of inequality, but also really to develop a, a livelihood in which we don't put first personal interest, but also acknowledge that, again, we are reflected in those relations that we have with other organisms. I think to, uh, uh, to follow up on this, on this thread here um, and with what I was saying before is this, this um, something about how, especially the psychoactive plants coming from these that were you know, steward, stewarded by, by cultures for thousands of years in some cases and find their way into the life of a general Western person and the experiences being so transformative and so big and so huge and so like just does not compute with life. How do I make sense of this? And, you know, it calling for, uh, calling for a wondering and a, a need to make sense of it that leads has led me to, you know, like, okay, so who were the peoples that were holding this before? Like maybe they have it figured out and it's like, Oh, actually it's just like a, there's just a whole different way of being in the world that's possible. And I think, when I think about ethnopharmacology teaching humanity, it very much is like through the the pharmacological actions of some of these plants, waking the sort of the sort of contracted Western colonial mind to a recognition of like, wait a minute, there's all these other ways to be and see in the world that are so much more in alignment with this deeply powerful experience I had that is more meaningful than anything I've had else in my entire life. And maybe there's something to honoring and integrating those things into my world rather than continuing on with the way things are now, because the way things are don't seem to be working out super well from the Western sort of dominator colonial agenda. And there being a value there too. Again, like even as I'm speaking of it, there's, there feels like I, I can't help but feel a little bit of that sort of colonial extractive sort of like tendency, even just coming out in my language, even though I'm not intending it to. But I, I'm seeing the value there of sort of the waking up to being like, wait, there are other ways of being in the world in relation with plants rather than using them as tools, for example, the living world rather than the repository of resources I use to make the things I like. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's, um, you know, the, the Greek word um, uh, pharmakon, um, which was, was just, you know, what pharmacy comes from, et cetera, et cetera. Um, was was used to um, refer to plants and substances that were either medicines or poisons. They were not. They were not. Uh, they were actually not or. They were medicines and poisons. It was the same word. Pharmacon meant medicine and poison. Um, and it, and it was understood 
um, that it could be either thing. It was both at the same time. We, when, we, when we separated, we forget that all poisons are medicinal if you reduce the dose uh, enough. Like, you know, we, we cure with radiation, you know, that's radiotherapy. And all medicines are poisonous if you, if you, if you open the dose enough and there's many there's different versions of this story and i've also heard about coca and about so that these these substances uh, these plants you know they're either a blessing or a curse they're a blessing and a curse and it depends on the quality of the relationship it depends on the respect um so you know you look at you know uh, our relationship with tobacco and you can see how tobacco turned into a curse for us uh, our use of tobacco barely resembles the use of indigenous people. I mean, it's just just sort of really very sort of on, only on the surface. And of course, coca is perhaps the biggest example of this, you know, a, 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 a plant that is, you know, widely, you know, a blessing in every one of the cultures that, that uses and nourishes has turned into an absolute uh, curse for us, right? And, and this is, as, as it's been split in two, equally damaging things, you know, cocaine on the one side and Coca-Cola on the other, which both have conquered the world uh, uh, and, you know, rotten our teeth and our noses and, you know, and our, and our economic systems and everything else. Um, so, you know, I, I think the, the, and this is, this is, you know, I was, you know, in, in, in you know, in our talk in ESPD, we're going to start with the story, uh, with this article we found about mezcal. And it basically describes how mezcal, which is sort of something that was, you know, a, a, a custom, largely homemade that happened, you know, all over Mexico, became very popular with hipsters and in certain bars and in cocktail, whatever. And then it just has been this huge sort of uh, a, a fashion of mezcal. I'm, I'm guilty myself. I love mezcal. And, and this has become, you know, a huge sustainability problem, even with all the legality, the tools of legality and the market and, and everything else. And there was one line in the, in the, in the article that I found fascinating. And, and he said, as, as it often happens when customs become products, uh, blah, 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 right? This is this is this is this is part of what we do. All of these things are actually we think that tobacco is a thing. You know, we, we think that ayahuasca is a thing. We think that we think that mushrooms are a thing, and you know, but actually they are. You know, customs is not a bad word. They're actually a sort of a, a set of practices, right? Now, in our case, the only time that this has happened. That the, that the plant has traveled together with a little bit of the custom, I would say it's been with ayahuasca. I think ayahuasca is sort of a, a, a very strange exception in the history of the plants that came from the Americas, uh, from indigenous people of the Americas, in the sense that it's the first time that the plant travels with sort of recognizable context. If you look at, at, the, at the ayahuasca circle in Europe, um, you will recognize things that could, you know, that, that you would associate in the, in the indigenous uh, and the big people sit in a circle. There's somebody that is a guide and that sort of takes responsibility for the people there. There's something that happens during the night in terms of some sort of songs or rituals is being created. You know, when you look, for example, at the way we use mushrooms and you compare it to the massive use of mushrooms, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, recognizable there, right? So, I'm, I'm hoping <laughs> that that uh, that it, that it's beginning to happen. That is beginning to happen in the sense that you were you're beginning to see this. There's another whole terrible aspect with that it has to do with appropriation and imitating and taking things that are not yours, etc. But I think we will get we will get past that. I think it's already. I think I think that's already getting better. Um, but but at the at the at the essence of it, there is a certain learning. You know, a certain learning in, in in the sense that okay, this is this should be respected and revered, and that, that everything that is around the sort of the, the custom uh, should also be made special. And we're not gonna go; we're all gonna get together, and we're all gonna drink at the same time. And some going, and we're going to try to make something that was all of this. You know, it's beginning. It's beginning. I would like to think um, it's beginning to happen, uh, and and and. And there is, you know, certainly, you know, if you care to follow the line back, this line starts 
you know, with the botanists, you know, and the ethnobotanists, you know, who were the, the, the first ones to say that not only is this, you know, uh, um, you know, potentially useful, but also, but also, you know, uh, uh, interesting and and uh, and, uh, and and important, right? Yeah, I think that's a very important, um, you know, topic that you have brought up, Geronimo, is the, you know, the, the idea that, you know, in terms of psychedelics, you know, is, is, is the challenge, I think, for the current uh, revitalization and, and interest in psychedelics and the, the dialogue that they're having with humanity currently is that, you know, many of the West, you know, people in the Western world who have now become exposed to these, these ancestral traditions, you know, they don't necessarily have, or for a better word, a lack of connection to their own traditions that they used to have, you know, because I think, you know, when we look at humanity, we all, you know, somewhere in the, in the evolution of our consciousness and relationship with, with, with nature, we've had traditions, you know, I mean, we can trace this back, you know, in, in Europe, in, in all, all parts of the world, we had, we had traditions with plants. And I think in many cases in the Western world that is reconnecting with these plants, the traditions are not there anymore. And so, you know, being exposed to, you know, other ways of relating to these plants, I think is, you know, essential in this step of evolution in our relationship with uh, psychoactive plants and, and their therapeutic potential. And um, I think it's a wonderful time, but I think as, as important as um, was just highlighted is that we cannot separate spirit from these um, tools, you know, of, of healing, of, of knowledge, uh, so many uh, potential things here. But, but I think, you know, ritual plays an essential role in, in you know, the efficacy of, the, of, these, of these tools. You know, I mean, it's challenging because, you know, we cannot say that it's only for, I mean, obviously these tools are for humanity. You know, the question is how do we responsibly use them in such a way that we can honor ourselves, honor these traditions and honor their dialogue with humanity uh, and grow. You know, I think this is the great potential here is that, you know, we can learn and grow from these experiences to evolve our, you know, consciousness, evolve our relationship and become, a, you know, a better, better loving people, <laughs> you know, better loving people to each other, to ourselves, to the planet. And, 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 you know, my hopes are too, is that through this, you know, revitalization and interest in psychedelics and, and, and other teacher plants and, and, you know, I call them nature's diplomats in some ways that we can really, you know, reconnect with this spirit, you know, and I think that's what's important is this, this spiritual connection is what has been lacking in many ways. And even as a scientist here, you know, going through traditional, uh, of bringing through this, you know, objective scientific perspective is challenging, you know, to acknowledge that, you know, perhaps maybe, you know, it may not be measurable, but there is some kind of spirit in nature or, or spirit in plants and, and spirit in these, in these, um, these medicines. And so how that connection, um, you know, uh, comes out of this experience will be interesting to see how, how humanity evolves with this and, and how, you know, years from now, we can, we can look back and, and, and hope that uh, we've made some good decisions along the way. Um, but it is challenging with the globalization, you know, and, and the increasing pressures on, on these plants as well. You know, something that it, we will highlight a little bit at ESPD 55 is, you know, because we have such global interest in these plants, you know, and, and there's such an increased demand and increased pressure on them you know how can we you know keep this relationship thriving for future generations for all of humanity and i think those are essential questions for us to to ask as as this dialogue continues Well, I also want to say that in, in this wave of um, reconciliation with nature, 
um, there is something really key that I want to bring again to the forefront, which is really the compensation to those cultures that mm. have shared with us. Um, these traditions, um, these rituals, these possibilities to relate to, to plants, and that in the end have also led to the development of, of new uses, okay. applications, um, ultimately for profit. And currently, for instance, in the case of Ayahuasca, Ayahe, there are eight current patents that mm. are um, bringing profit mm. uh, to primarily pharmaceutical companies that because of the history of, of, of these institutions and of the policies that regulate them, um, we have still not made the bridge really to compensate those people who have shared with us their knowledge and who, who are the intellectual authors of, 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 of that knowledge and, and who also have very clear guidelines and um, aspirations as far as how to relate to these um, beings. Um, and, and I think that that is also very exciting from our time that um, there are mechanisms that are being put in place so that these conversations and processes can be built. Um, and, and I think that that's also part of it. So I, I, I um, want to highlight what uh, Michael uh, has mentioned through this call about uh, the reconciliation with nature, which is something that I think also goes hand in hand with the compensation of cultures. Mm -hmm. So that if we are able to move forward towards putting to the forefront equity um, and, and, and really to, to push towards compensating these people who, who have shared these, these opportunities, possibilities for us to expand in our consciousness, but who very clearly are marginalized in the global economy, then I think we will also be um, giving that step towards reconciling ourselves with uh, that division, artificial division that we have created between us and nature. I agree. And I guess, like I said before, you know, this division comes from uh, of our separation from nature and, and comes from sort of the <clears throat> scientific uh, extraction of like a single chemical or molecule from these uh, substances. And in doing so, we're not only losing our connection to the, the plants and the organisms, but we're also then we're packaging that into like a pill or something and shipping it off in a bottle. We're not having, we're also losing connection to uh, the rituals and, and sort of that, that set and setting, which is just as much a, a factor of, of shaping the outcome of uh, and effectiveness of, of any medicine. So uh, yeah, yes, we need to, rebuild these bridges and gain a more expanded uh, appreciation for uh, the ways in which we relate to the, these substances beyond just, you know, taking a single molecule or something. I was wondering, you know, um, I was thinking if this sort of this, 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 this obsession with like, you know, the, the, the standardized, for example, they're trying to standardize extracts around plants and all of this, and that, you know, until you know the exact compounds and you can measure them, then you cannot possibly mark, market these things because you don't know how much there is and this whole, this whole dilemma. It, act, it actually comes because when they started e extracting the pure compounds, these were so much more toxic and then dosage. Uh, that, that was not eyeable, you know, that was something that you could, which is what you do with plants, you just eye them out, you know, basically, it's just eyeball the thing, you know, some, some will have more concentration, some will have less, sometimes it will be stronger, sometimes it will be weaker, you will know immediately, and maybe no big deal, you just manage your dose, you know, but this, this cannot be done with the, with the pure extracts, it's much harder, because sometimes it's smaller, and then this obsession comes with getting you know, the, the right, the, 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 the idea of dosage, and then this is pushed back into the plants. Um, so that, that, that sort of the concept goes back like that, you know, it, it's, 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 it's pushed, it comes from 
it comes already from a, from a, from a, it's, it's not it's not a it's not a problem in, in plant medicine uh, you know things were measured in, in in handfuls you know or in pots you know and it was plenty you know uh, sometimes the brew was stronger sometimes it was weaker but that was no big deal you need, there was no need for standardization of any sort until you you deal with it but as, but sometimes i want this way of things to come back like this you know Sometimes, you know, what you, what I always wonder, you know, what, what you were saying, David, about, about giving back, which of course, you know, but then the, the actual, if, how that's something that comes from us, you know, we're used to like paying royalties or paying whatever or, or property and that gets paid for because, and then you take this back that way. Um, and then one finds oneself, you know, for example, in the case of ayahuasca, imagining that these seven people with seven patents wanted to give back. And then the question becomes, but we give back to who, who are the rightful owners? And now we need a registry because that's how we work. And then now we need to have exact, the exact list of the groups that use and do not use ayahuasca and who is in and who is out and how is this proven? And then who are the representatives with the bank accounts that will receive, you know, and suddenly we're again dragging uh, uh, um, with the best intention, even even with the best intentions, um, dragging this 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 this, this um, you know suddenly there's there, there needs to be an official registry because otherwise how is this going to come back if not with like something that is specified and a contract that is signed and in the contracts the parts have to be specified and and who are the parts and then they have to be enumerated and suddenly you know it's it's you know I was reading um, it's 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 amazing how tangled <laughs> and yeah. how quickly things get tangled you know with what looks like you know. Uh, um, um, you know, even 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 with with best intentions, you know, it's it's something that I've given a lot of um, thought to over over the years. This question of how can it be reciprocal? Also, because looking about, about how unreciprocal my own relationships with indigenous people have been in the terms that, in terms of that I've you know not not reciprocal but asymmetric, in terms that I've gotten so much more benefit than they have from our encounters, not just the ontological benefits and the, and the healing and, and, uh, and, and, and all of this, but also, you know, being able to, you know, sit here in Zooms like this and get invited to conferences to talk, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the amount of benefit I've gotten is, uh, uh, you know, uh, humongous. And, you know, the, I've, 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 I think my relationship has been kind and fair and I've, you know, paid fairly for all my services and respectfully to indigenous people. But the benefit that they have gotten from our encounter is certainly not as not nowhere near as mm -hmm. as uh, as as high. But how does you know how does one manage um, um, manage this? Uh, um, uh, is is it's really the, um, the 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 work of a lifetime, and, and and on the personal level, and and on the institutional level, I have no idea. I'm, I'm <laughs> be honest. I've looked into it, and you know, and I've followed different threads and stuff, and 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 I it 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 it's it's so difficult. I think um, that's a very important uh, you know point you bring up. It's an I think it's an immense challenge. Um, you know, how do we give back in reciprocity, not only to these cultures, but to the plants themselves? You know, one idea I kind of had with this is uh, if we look at the valuation, I mean, not to look at this economically, but if we look at the potential valuation of, you know, ayahuasca, for example, and, you know, how many people are traveling to the Amazon each year and how much is being exported each year, you know, the potential value of the uh, of this whole system as it is exploding into the global sphere with globalization you know one idea that i you know had come to mind is like if we if we really saw the the value of this system you know wouldn't it be worth investing in such a way that instead of cattle ranching and and soya bean farming and 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 you know these agricultural industries that are you know really you know, at the forefront of the forces of deforestation in, in the Amazon, you know, wouldn't it be uh, 
maybe perhaps virtuous, but a great idea to be able to, you know, ensure that ancestral lands of the Amazon are in some cases encoded to the indigenous and local peoples where they can, you know, take care of and, and grow these plants, you know, for for themselves and, and hopefully in some way a repository of this knowledge can persist and be for humanity as well. I think that that could be some approach that, that could help, uh, you know, in some cases with sustainability, but also in some cases reciprocity with looking at, uh, you know, protection of, of lands for local and peoples and indigenous communities so that they are no longer decimated you know, at such a, an alarming rate, but how to do this from a, you know, from a practical perspective is, is really, I think, you know, beyond my scope of, of expertise, but I think it, it is something that could be, could be looked at with many, many players. And I think too, bringing the voices of indigenous peoples and local communities to these conversations will be essential you know, and and trying to you know iron iron this out. Um, it's clear we don't have the, the answers of this, but I think too, you know, we cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater, and we really, you know, this is an important juncture because you know we have the lungs of the planet, you know, that is that is under incredible pressure, you know, as we speak. You know, and I think, um, you know, all of these knowledge systems, you know, are at stake as well. And if we lose this, I think this would be a tremendous uh, detriment to the planet, but also to humanity. Uh, and beyond ayahuasca, I mean, there's so many, so much therapeutic potential in, in the Amazon and in general. I mean, as, you know, Colin had mentioned, you know, less than one half of 1% of all medicinal plant species have been looked at for their therapeutic use. Um, you know, and there's about 400,000 species of plants in the Amazon. So if we do the math, there's quite a bit of work that could be done. But again, too, you know, this knowledge of, of you know, dosage, you know, and I think that's critical as well, looking at these traditional knowledge systems and, and understanding this relationship with these plants in such a way that goes beyond the resource you know, centered approach and looking at them, but more as a, a, re a relationship of reciprocity, I think is, is, is key. You know, how do we, how do we get that understanding um, and how do we encourage that understanding to the global community is also, you know, uh, um, an important uh, endeavor. But I think too, that's also kind of, you know, in a circular way of thinking, how psychedelics have hel are helping in a way, you know, with humanity, uh, you know, because, you know, I think I go back to this idea that, you know, Dennis McKenna constantly is, you know, ringing in my ear saying, you know, you know, wake up, you monkeys, you're not running the show, you know, something like that. But I think that's something that psychedelics have, have taught many of us, I, you know, myself included, you know, really to, to you know, look within to see how um, we can be better, you know, to look within to see how we can approach things differently, you know, and I think this is, uh, this is an important, these are all important questions. I, I would love to see this, um, you know, this paradigm shift where we can honor these knowledge systems, we can honor these, you know, indigenous peoples and local communities for their knowledge and ensure that their knowledge systems remain intact, that, that, but that also that we can grow together, you know, that there is less of this idea of separation between, you know, co different culture, you know, um, 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 the Eurocentric model of reality that's, that's driving Western culture and so on and so forth, but, but more uh, the development of a, a holistic understanding of a global community that, that we are all, you know, together in this, in this connection with nature and learning how we can live together in such a way that, that um, you know, sparks this reciprocity worldwide, you know. And, and one, one fact, too, is, you know, like with the, with, the, with the idea of ethnopharmacology is that, you know, we have, you know, although, you know, the idea that, you know, Western medicine has, has made such advancements, but, but yet, you know, over 80% of the world's population still primarily rely on medicinal plants for healing. So I think this is a, 
a very important uh, you know thing to remember is that you know many of the world's populations still have a direct relationship with these plants and so, and they have this connection to these plants you know these are you know part of their songs part of their stories part of their ways of life and and i think that is something you know that can be a starting point for for all of us to think about is that you know regardless of the culture we come from is that that is a primary source of healing for most of humanity at this point and so within that domain you know what relationships can we build you know and rebuild if they have been lost and then approach this uh this uh growing network of, of a global family that, that's a hopefully uh, something that we can all collectively work towards yeah i agree i i, I think that all, all these ideas that have been shared through this call are very important because um we can definitely pinpoint needs that need to be addressed and in that way, I, I want to just um, um, review like some that I think have been uh, mentioned throughout the call that stand out, like the one of our um, reparation of our relationship with nature, the one of, of reciprocity with with um, cultures and marginalized communities in general. And, and I want to bring one more in, which is the one of our sovereignty. Um, which I think that it's, it's, it's tightly related to, to that of, of reciprocity as well. And, and, and in that sense, then it will also enable us to um, repair our relationship with nature. And because when looking at the policies that give power to, to corporations to, to be able to, to profit from um, knowledge that has been, that has derived from other cultures without necessarily compensating them, because, I mean, there's also very much real issues such as uh, what Herman was mentioning as far as, okay, who are those people who actually have been using it? How many are there? And, and all these different um, requirements that need to be fulfilled to uh, fairly compensate those those groups. But yet again, I mean, it is not there, there's not really substantial effort that has been done at present towards that end. So that's still a gap that needs to be addressed somehow. But ultimately, seeing that can also drive into further issues of um, incorporation, so to speak, into th that type of, 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 of mentality, of, of Western Enlightenment mentality, in which uh, other cultures have to abide by the policies of the dominant cultures. Mm -hmm. I think sovereignty it's, it stands out there as something also key to address. I, I see the idea of reciprocity as something pending that still is like the white elephant in the room that needs to be urgently addressed because the level of, of economic marginalization of communities is, is, is extreme. Um, but uh, sovereignty is definitely, I think, more of an ultimate goal uh, through our research, through our institutions' efforts as well to enable these groups to be able to self-determine how they want to, to live and, and how they want to project uh, their futures uh, in, in very basic ways that are not guaranteed at present. Just in, in Colombia alone, uh, we are constantly bombarded by all sorts of all resource extraction endeavors that end up completely ignoring communities, and, and that is still happening. So, so yes, I think sovereignty, it's something there as well that needs to be incorporated and addressed through our research, and ethnopharmacology, I think, should also start to, to be mentioned, uh, discussed, and, and hopefully addressed so that we can all put our seat and uh, our contribution towards uh, a, a decolonizing world. Very well put. I think something that's been that's been coming up for me as I've been listening um, is just the, I guess the scale and complexity of the problem in some sense, um, and 
and one thought that I was having was like drawing this sort of uh, this this drama in my head, not not to minimize it. I mean, drama in the sense of like it was like almost like a theatrical play that was some sort of strange iteration of what might be happening of this sort of like this aggressive dance between one worldview and another, and the one worldview being sort of dominator Western extraction, uh, you know, refinement and the mind, 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 and all this versus like pretty much every other culture <laughs> that existed before it in some sense, like colonial mindset versus indigenous mindset, which is maybe a bit um, far too reductionistic to put it down to the, it being one kind of mindset there. And just like wondering about it in the sense of this dominator hierarchy extract colonize being this very traumatized place traumatized and traumatizing in, in all ways. And, and those sort of winning at that sort of agenda are ones that are also quite traumatized. If they weren't, they wouldn't be attempting to win at this. And there's being a profound kind of healing that's possible in the sort of um, the, you know, reintroduction of this sort of ways of being that, that each of you have been speaking about. And then wondering how much of that requires in a lot of ways, like slowing down, like a profound sort of slowing down. When I think about being in relationship with a plant, you know, I'm not able to like do that in the five minutes, you know, between Zoom meetings, right? Um, on my phone or whatever it might be. It takes time to like slow down and be with a tree, for example, to really get a sense of like being with it in some in some way. And yet the scale of, and, and pace of the problems and just wondering and the drama in my mind is just wondering about like, whether or not that sort of like that healing is going to be able to intervene strongly enough to sort of like disrupt the pace and trajectory of the wounding to a, a significant enough measure that it sort of um, that it alters course before it's too late in some sense. Now I'm, I'm also conscientious of how much what I just characterized is very dualistic. It's almost good versus evil in some way, which itself is very colonialist thinking maybe and rooted in my own sort of like deep enmeshment of Christian culture. Cause that's what I was raised in and so on and so forth. So I recognize critically where that comes from. Um, but then I'm also wondering about that a sort of deep wondering, not doesn't make sense because it might not work kind of wondering, but like a, is it is is it even possible you know um yeah i think i'll 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 i think that's my thought Well, I want to say that as far as whether it's possible or not, it, it can somehow be a little bit secondary just because I think ethic ethically we can all see that that it's really what needs to be done uh, or, or attempted to be done. Now, as far as looking possibility through a more optimistic light, I, I can imagine that generations back, during territorial conflicts, it could have stand out as impossible for a ruler to take over the world and for actually the, the world being controlled by economic centers as it is at present. So if, if that was an impossibility back then, possibly, um, I, I think that it could also stand as an impossibility to go back to a, a less um, central centralized uh, economical control um, world, but that if we have been the forces or, or if there are um, identifiable forces behind this colonization, uh, I think that those very forces could also be the allies if, if, if there's will to go back into a world that accepts diversity of, of, of thought diversity of relating to the their surrounding diversity of, of realities as well 
acknowledged, right? And, and, and it has to be attempted. I think that there's many layers there and that could be probably the most problematic, just one that I think could be served as an example as far as scale, uh, which has been mentioned in the call. It's, uh, for example, the geographical um, area that indigenous people may have at present under their control. Like the indigenous people that you work with, for example, have lost 96% of their ancestral territory within 70 years. So what is going to happen to, to that? Like what it's going to be repairing that? Is it going to be giving them back the 96% that was taken away from them? So what's going to happen to the 96%? Uh, I mean, to the people that are now in that 96% area, you know, are they going to be put away? It, it, it's extremely difficult to, I mean, fully, I think, feel satisfied as far as having fulfilled the goal of reparation, um, maybe decolonization itself, I think, is extremely difficult to, to, to fully feel satisfied with, with any action and, and to state, okay, decolonization has happened. But I think that we can identify specific acts that need to be done um, to move ourselves towards a more ethical and um, equitable world. Something you know that was that was coming up as uh, David was speaking, and I think was addressed like right from the beginning is like irrespective of whether or not it's going to work. You know, there's and I don't mean right as in right and wrong. There's something that just like feels deeply true about efforting, anyways, if that makes sense. Like because it feels like it what needs needs to be done, irrespective of whether or not it's going to succeed in preventing the trajectory of the sort of present sort of destruction agenda um and that was like that was like a really nice reminder um and it felt really good to hear that and sort of met that sort of like breakneck speed of destruction versus the slowing down to actually listen being like we, we can't slow down because it's like this but this is not slowing down is what's making this worse and it's like yeah but just slow down anyways in some sense because like the just slowing down is part of actually bringing it back or something. I don't know if that makes sense, but there was like, um, there was a, there was a, there was a positive reception in my body uh, when David spoke to that sort of like, yeah, it, regardless, you know, we do it because yeah. So I just wanted to echo that into the, into the call. Thank you, James. Um, well, and I think to add to that, I don't think we have a choice, you know, I mean, we, I mean, if we look at the current state of the world, you know, we have tremendous crises going on, you know, at our front doors, and these can no longer be ignored, I think, for the persistence of, you know, not only these cultures and the ecosystem, but for humanity itself. I think this is a critical juncture in history. Um, and this is definitely, you know, an, an important endeavor for, for all of us, really, to look within and to be at our best and to do what we can to play a role, big or small, you know, and really addressing some of these major issues. And I think like it had been mentioned as it's going to take some of these, you know, big players, you know, in, in these power structures to, to, you know, to, to acknowledge that these systems are very fragile and, and perhaps shift the, the mindset of the material wealth pursuit, you know, over, inner riches and over, you know, you know, this, this uh, balance with humanity and nature. Uh, the question is, what is, what is the incentive, you know, for these institutions that, you know, are thriving on these economical systems and, and, you know, have these traditions in place. Um, these are big questions too. You know, I think they're, they're, in some cases, you know, it's, it's hopeful that, you know, there's an aha moment, you know, an awakening, you know, within, within these uh, power structures and these, and these, uh, these institutions that, you know, without reconciling this, that, you know, they too will crumble because we're all interconnected, you know, and I think that's, a, that would be, or that is an essential uh, part of this process, I think, that, that, 
you know, is, um, is going to be key is, is really that shift in mindset, you know, and, 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 and really understanding that, you know, how, you know, this uh, pursuit has affected the world, but how can we, you know, how can we be a catalyst for change and, and, and facilitating that shift? So it's going to take, I think, at least to my mind, and I cannot speak on all of it because this is, you know, beyond my expertise, but I think um, it's going to take a collective effort, you know, from people uh, worldwide to really um, spark this change and shift. And, and I think it takes an honest look at, you know, what we have done historically and we see, okay, historically, this probably or may or may not be the best for humanity, may or may not be the best for the planet. You know, so there's a choice. Do we continue as business as usual and continue to the destruction of the planet and, and ultimately ourselves at the, at the you, know, pr- you know, pursuit of material wealth over inner riches? Or, or can we turn this around? You know, is there a way in which we can turn this around that's not so focused on, uh, you know, having this, these profit margins and, and, and um, you know, these extractive um, processes that are, that are posing big threats to these cultural and, and ecological systems? And, um, you know, I don't like to think of it, but, you know, in the case of, you know, global challenges, disasters, catastrophes, a lot of this is brought into our face, you know, and to the forefront of recognizing, hey, we're pretty fragile. You know, when, when, when few food security is threatened, we recognize, hey, we're pretty fragile. You know, when, 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 when uh, you know, our biomedical systems are challenged, you know, and resources are scanned, we're, we re- re- recognize how fragile we are, you know, and, you know, that puts us into, you know, thinking here, I, you know, I live um, in Hawaii right now. And so we're one of the most isolated land masses on the planet. A lot of our, you know, resources are, are imported, you know, and we have a lot of potential to be self-sustaining here. But if you think about it, you know, food security is a big thing. And how many of us here in these residential areas can grow our own food or can, you know, make our clothes or make our medicines and, and learn, you know, or have this, this uh, tool set if we really needed it, you know, if, if everything shut down and these infrastructures were not able to provide for, you know, everybody, your neighbor, you know, and this kind of thing, how would you make it? And I think these are, you know, taking it into like more of a personal level, you know, one of the things that, you know, ethnobiology has, has really highlighted for myself and even psychedelics is like, you know, being uh, self-accountable and recognizing our own limitations and where we can grow, you know, learning how to uh, be able to provide for oneself, you know, without relying on, on, on these, um, you know, systems so much. I mean, obviously being in, you know, in a, a city area or an urbanization area, you have some, you have, you know, you're in the system, you're not off the grid, you know, per se, but, but I think, uh, you know, relearning, you know, and re, uh, reevaluating our own uh, resilience is, is key, and I think if we recognize this, this, you know, fragility in humanity as a whole, um, then perhaps that is one way, way we can begin, you know, to relearn how to grow our own food, relearn how to, you know, um, to, to take care of oneself. And, and, and as, you know, from that, being a living example for our, our friends and family and, and hoping that that will, you know, spark change across the board. I hope. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll step in here. It seems like a nice sort of like breather moment. Uh, to maybe introduce or and end this phase of the conversation and introduce the sort of uh, final stage. So uh, what we'll do in, in this part of the conversation uh, is we'll each go through and we'll share one clear, coherent, concluding thought that we're holding from this conversation. Um, and 
we will go in reverse order from which I see us on the screen, um, which will be David, Geronimo, Michael, myself, and Colin. If you're not ready, uh, just pass and we'll circle back. Uh, so David, whenever you're ready, no rush, um, take us away. Okay, so I want to say that we need to incorporate and bring to the forefront uh, and address sovereignty, reciprocity, and reparation, uh, as well as self-reliance in a sustainable environment. If we are to maximize what ethnopharmacology has to offer us to continue expanding our consciousness while being good stewards to the planet and all forms of life. Um, you know, when I, when I thought of like closing talks, one thing that came to mind, I'm, I'm not sure why, is something I thought, you know, when um, when Michael was talking about, you know, the, the the deforestation of the Amazon and the lungs of the world, and it's it's a it's an argument that is made from Brazil, uh, from Brazilian people, not always from indigenous, not even from indigenous people, um, not always anyway, and it's something like, you know, you know, but sort of you know, Europeans and North Americans cut all of their own trees. And with this, they made their industrial revolutions and they became, uh, and, and, uh, and that all of the colonization, and with this, they became rich. And then they want us to keep our trees where they are when they cut all of their own, under, under the reason that it will is the lungs of the world and what about the rest of us? Please don't cut your trees for us. If you don't want us to cut our trees, pay us. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and we want, and of course, you know, they have a, a, a very valid point, right? Uh, we were not making arguments for the, for the uh, you know, for the, for, the, for the oxygen of the earth when we cut all of our own trees and, you know, and burn all of our coal and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, I, think, I think there's... Um, there is, you know, and that I will tie up with what I was saying at the at the at the beginning. Like again, you think you think you are looking at uh, at uh, at how other people live, and you end up looking at yourself. Um, and uh, and and uh, and here we are again. Yeah, what wonderful! Yeah, I think uh, you know. It's such a wonderful opportunity to to really uh, have these open discussions uh, with with all of us here, because I think that's the beautiful part about the human experience is that we all have perspective, and we all have knowledge that can help uh, help us learn and, and see differently. You know, even within ourselves, and I think that's one of the main points that have been brought up, and um, that is something I think the main. The main takeaway for for me on this, and it has been a constant message that I've gotten in, you know, my own experiences with plant medicine is is, you know, that you know, a reflection of oneself, you know, and 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 ultimately expressing that, you know, through my action, you know, what I learned through, you know, interacting with people with different worldviews, what I learned from you know, my own relationships as they evolve with plants is that, um, you know, this humility and that there is so much to learn and there's so much to forgive oneself for and that, you know, this is an opportunity to grow. And I think with all of these discussions, you know, highlighting the importance of ethnopharmacology and ethnobiology really you know, bringing this into the global sphere where even this discipline itself has been marginalized. You know, we can look at this as a way in which, like, as, you know, Geronimo has mentioned, like holding up the mirror, you know, for humanity to see. We see the myriad of voices of all the cultures of all the worlds and all their relationships with plants and, and bioactive chemicals and, 
you know, from whatever perspectives we look at this, you know, this provides a platform for us to reconcile our relationships between all of the human family, you know, all of the organismal family and, 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 and start again. You know, this is a hope, you know, to, um, to grow from this process. I think we have great, you know, potential humanity in our evolution of consciousness and, and knowledge and, and all of this as, that has come from, you know, this, this, uh, you know, this growth. And, and we have not, it's clear we have not made all the right decisions and, and we may not continue to do so either, but, but there is a chance, you know, that, that, you know, pharmacology and psychedelics, for example, can, can at least spark this, this alternative perspective of oneself and how we can learn from each other and, and to, to help create a better understanding of our place in which we are here momentarily and to do the best we can so that it'll be around for future generations. So that is my, my thought on this and just honored to be amongst so many brilliant minds here today. So thank you. Well, Thanks. Oh, sorry. I was going to go and then Colin, you could finish us off just because of instruction the screen. I don't also don't want to end with like bringing in the last thought. Um, also, interestingly enough, uh, what I was going to offer as my last thought was just reflecting on speaking of, you know, what does ethnopharmacology have to teach humanity? One of the things that was felt really alive for me in this conversation was how much the, there was so much value in me sort of actually listening to hear what the rest of you had to teach me in this, in this conversation and how much that, yeah, just some, something about like the, how much there is to learn out of, out of the study as reflected by each of you sharing in this conversation and uh, the value I felt I was experiencing and also creating a space for others to experience by listening and really putting myself in a position to learn from each of you in this call. And yeah. Colin. Yeah. This has been very uh, eye opening and I also appreciate the you know diversity of perspectives and considerations that everyone has raised that just shows how uh, why this field of ethnopharmacology is and, and the many uh, branches that it connects to. Um, but like everyone has said, you know, we just need to have a greater appreciation and, and understanding of the value of these uh, traditional knowledge systems and ecosystems, not value in the sense of you know, material wealth or what can we get from it, but, you know, the importance uh, for our continued well-being. Um, and I, I guess ethnopharmacology in one sense could be just be looked at as how can we heal and, you know, not just physical, you know, medicine, but how can we heal and give back to human cultures to the environment to the forest you know what do we need to do not to gain but to also give back and and um so it's been a it's been a pleasure to, to hear all these diverse perspectives and 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 hopefully ethnopharmacology as a whole discipline can just enrich and expand our you know perspective on on how we can relate to and, and better um, value our place in the world. All right. With that, I'll put the, um, the, the manager hat back on for a second, um, and speak directly to the listeners, um, that if you enjoyed what you heard here today, each of the people on this call, except for myself, We'll be presenting at the ESP D55 symposium. Uh, details will be coming soon. All of their information will be at the show notes of this episode, jameswjessup.com. Um, and I am looking forward to uh, hearing each of your presentations at the symposium as well. Uh, and with that, thank you to each of you for your time uh, coming on the show today, what you're doing for your work in the world and, and what you've uh, offered here um, on this call. So thank you very much. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a great pleasure and an honor.
Likewise, I've learned a lot. Yeah. Beautiful. I look forward to seeing you guys uh, in a few days. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And cut. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. If you enjoyed it, please give the podcast a five-star review on iTunes and leave some sort of positive review. That's very helpful. You could also like and subscribe to this podcast wherever you check it out. Spotify, iTunes, Podcast Addict, that's what I use, whatever it is. Uh, your subscription's also positive. And uh, if you liked what you heard here today and you'd like to explore more of what these guys have to offer, definitely check out the ESPD 55 conference happening May 23rd to 26th uh, of this year, 2022. You can head to ESPD55.com to check that out. Access to the live stream is by donation and the donation has a minimum of only 10 US, which is a super amazing opportunity. Thank you to the conference organizers uh, for making that so accessible for so many people. You could also support the show financially by becoming a patron, leaving a one-time donation or purchasing something off of the shop. Uh, links to doing so will be in the description to this episode, wherever you are checking it out. Uh, so thank you very much for tuning in and I will see you on the next episode of Adventures Through the Mind. And until then, take care.